G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, another upload today. Uh, this time it is in reference to that post I put up on the community tab on my YouTube channel and uh, basically open the floor to some trade and free agency questions that you might have. Again, not billing myself in a, as an expert or anything like that, but uh, it was kind of open the, the door for some topics. Anything you want to see discussed on the channel regarding the trade period itself, um, I was keen to do a video that is catered to your specific needs, so I guess that's what we'll do. So I've collated all the uh, questions you asked on that particular tab and I I am going to sit here and answer them one by one. Cool, so there is a variety of questions in here. Uh, there, there's about a bunch of different teams. The first two happen to be about the Eagles, guys, so um, be patient if you're not interested in that. But we'll start off with Krub22, who asks, theoretically, if Dan Curtin slides to say Geelong's pick, which is uh, I think pick eight, which would become like 10 or 11, uh, how viable would it be for West Coast to try to trade up to get Dan Curtin using something like a future first? So. Let's be real about this. Uh, West Coast's future first is probably going to be in the top handful of picks. Like I am a optimistic West Coast fan. Slowly and slowly over the last few years, my faith that we'll return to being a good side soon has been eroded. But I think we just have to think pragmatically. And honestly, what other team would be likely, more likely to win the wooden spoon next year than West Coast? So we have to be really careful about trading this pick because it could be pick one. And regardless of Dan Curtin looking like a good prospect and the Eagles apparently being interested, it's a huge gamble. It is a huge gamble. Is Dan Curtin a better prospect than, say, Finn O'Sullivan or Sid Draper or whoever's going to be pick one next year? I think it's uh, speculative to, to bet on that, I would say. So to answer your question, I like the look of Dan Curtin. He doesn't look like a traditional key defender to me, but nonetheless, he looks like a big competitive beast. He's got skills. He's got... He's got talent. I think he's got the potential to be a game breaker. But at the same time, he might be just an oversized back flanker. And I just wouldn't want to spend potentially pick one on that. So is there an opportunity for us to trade into this pick? Well, I, I think we, our options have dried up. If we hold pick one and we take Harley Reid, our next pick is going to be in the mid to late 20s. And then our future second will probably be 19 at best. Actually, I think 21 at best after the two priority picks next year as well. So 21 and 29 won't trade up to Geelong's uh, pick 11. So I, I just don't think it's feasible. And nor, I don't want to touch that future first round pick. If we got offered pick two this year for a future first round pick and we got the chance to get McKercher, I'd probably take that because I really like McKercher and I think his talent would probably stack up. I don't think Curtin's necessarily stacks up unless... You know, unless he was a key forward and, you know, Jed Walter-esque, you know, close to that talent, it would probably become worth it. But I don't think so, unfortunately. Diz YT asks, this is another Eagles question, which players from last year's full team do you think slip out of the best 22 with no injuries? Think of adding back Cully, Ryan, McGovern, and potentially Reed if he comes. So uh, first of all, I, I don't think Jai Cully will be in our best 22 if we're fully fit. Um, he does have an ACL, but I know what you're talking about. When he's fit, how do we get him back in? Look, this is a messy question to answer because West Coast had so so many injuries last year that we never really saw what the, the 22 was. It was kind of a rotating merry-go-round of average players at times, and that was true in 2022 as well. But what I've done is I've gone and looked at who played a lot of regular games last year, particularly towards the back end, and uh, looked at the ones who are likely to come out if we have a fully fit list. And the ones that came to mind, I think Chesser and Bazo are just a little bit raw at the moment to probably start round one. Um, I'd like to think they're both capable of making it back into the time, team throughout the year, but they're probably two that make way, particularly if Gov's in the side. Luke Edwards as well, I don't think did enough to earn a spot for round one. I think he's lucky to have a contract. I like the kid, but he just didn't do enough this year. Jack Williams probably makes way as well. I, I would have thought that um, the, the addition of Matthew Flynn pushes Williams to Jack, uh, sorry, Bailey Williams to Jack Williams' role. Got too many W's and R's there. And unfortunately for Jack Williams, he will probably have to start in the waffle. And probably one is Witherden. I think he did play well last year, but actually, no, as I say it, I think Witherden will start round one. So we're probably just looking at four major changes there. And that's just out of players who played regularly. Again, this is, it's a messy question to answer, but I think hope that answers your question. The next question we have is Kevin Murali Duran. He says, hey, Jesse, with father and son academy and academy picks, why is it that the picks, the club that have that falls after the play? I messed that question up. <laughs> with father's sons and academy picks, why is it that the picks the club have that falls after the player is expected to be drafted, Jed Walter and Gold Coast having to trade to pick four, useless? 
I'm sorry if I muddled that up. I do know exactly what you're asking me. So why does Gold Coast need to trade pick four um, and why does pick four become useless? I have used that term uh, previously. So how it works is if West Coast, sorry, Gold Coast go into this draft with pick four and Jed Walter gets bid on with pick two, uh, pick four gets absorbed into that and um, they might get a, like an improved draft position later. Like there's going to be a point surplus and it moves a later pick up, but they lose that pick four. So the smart way to do it is what they could do and what they did in this case was trade forward down to 10 and 17, as well as a future first, but that's not relevant to this particular thing. 10 and 17 can be combined together to match two, essentially. I'm really simplifying it there, but 10 and 17's points added up will be used to match pick two. So Gold Coast had the choice of having pick four and having it absorbed or trading pick four for 10, 17 and a future first. 10 and 17 get absorbed and now they have a future first round pick. I hope that makes sense. That's probably the best way I can explain it. Um, maybe that's my own limitation, but I hope I've clarified that a bit. Tommy asks, as an Eagles fan, sorry, I think this is the last Eagles question. As an Eagles fan, what minimum trade would you accept for pick one? Okay. Um, honestly, I think for me, the threshold's probably, what I want is two and three. Again, not realistic. I don't think North are going to offer that, but that is probably, that that is a deal I would accept, two and three. So let's just set that as, as something that I'm hopeful for. On the other end, two, 15 and 17, uh, definitely not enough. I think that's too much of a drop off in talent. But if we can get two picks in the top half a dozen, that's where that's where I think the, the threshold probably is. So let's say it's two and six, that could potentially get McCurcher and Curtin. Two and six is a very good deal. That would certainly be, that's the threshold at which I would seriously consider it. If it was two, six, and 17, like an extra sweetener, that's probably where I would say yes. So I hope that answers your question. And that's not necessarily me overrating pick one. That's just my personal threshold of what I'd want to give up. Moldy Cheese asks a uh, fairly long-winded question about the uh, Northern Academy. So he says, what are your thoughts on the NGA priorities that the Queensland and New South Wales teams get? And what changes could the AFL, uh, should they make? Just to clarify, there's an important clarification here, and I made this mistake earlier this year as well. There is a distinction between Northern Academies and Next Generation Academies. So the Northern Academies apply to the four Queensland and New South Wales teams. The Next Generation Academies are different in that they apply to, well, everyone else. And they're more about finding speculative talent who have either diverse ethnic backgrounds, like uh, for instance, Machido Owens, I think is Singaporean. Uh, Jordan Baker from the Eagles, I think is Malaysian or part Malaysian anyway. Neil Erasmus actually qualified for West Coast uh, because I believe he is South African born or part South African. The Northern Academies is different. They're just simply uh, academies where the players in those states play for those clubs. And there is different rules for both of them. So the rest of the competition, um, the next generation academy talents you can't match a bid in the top 40 for them no such restriction applies to the northern academy so we'll go back to the question should matching uh, bids only be available after the first round should every team have a pick guaranteed in the first round of the draft before any free agency next generation priority picks etc it just seems ridiculous that the team who finished last on the ladder will have their second pick in the late 20s by the time all the extra picks get um, added in I agree. Obviously, um, I'm a West Coast fan, so I know exactly what you mean by that. Look, I think the Northern Academies, is, there's been an overcorrection. So it's unfortunate because what we wanted to see was growth in the game in these Northern states. And it just seems like talent is coming out left, right and center from these states now. And it's created a little bit of an unevenness. So Jed Walter going pick two. The, the weakness in that example as well, Jed Walter like grew up in Perth and was always going to be a footballer. And I would challenge really like how much he really owes to the Gold Coast Academy for training him up to be a top two prospect. That would be the counter argument, but I just, I don't see it. Like, I'm sure we don't really care because it's Gold Coast, but I mean, if you look at how much Northern Academies have benefited someone like a Sydney, for instance, you know, Nick Blakey was a father son for uh, North Melbourne, if I'm not mistaken. His father was John Blakey. And he was also a part of the Sydney Academy talent. So they got, you know, priority access to him. Under the old rules, Isaac Heaney went to Sydney for pick three because they matched it with pick 18 when they made the grand final that year. Errol Goulden, Braden Campbell, these are all next generation academy talents that have benefited what is already a strong team. So I agree. I think what I do is probably split the difference. Next generation academy talents probably maybe make it top 10 or top 20 that they can't match a bid on and also bring back Northern Generation Academy talents maybe to pick 30 or so because they're probably disincentivizing clubs investing in the next generation academy because if they produce a top 40 talent they don't even get access to it anyway so what is that threshold is it pick 20 pick 30 i'm not too sure they should play with it but i think they overcorrected this time jamara ugo hagen obviously was pick one uh, as a next generation academy talent and they pushed it out to 40 if i'm not mistaken bring it back to 20 and let's see how that goes for a little bit as for free agency maybe i think that's the way it might may go uh, band one compensation potentially uh, becomes end of first round but we'll see i wouldn't be surprised if the afl is looking at the mechanism 
um, there and being quite pleased that North Melbourne got pick three. I think they'll be happy that that happened. So I don't see it happening anytime soon, but that's probably the changes that I would make. Uh, Chomix has two questions. Who looks the most promising to improve in the 2024 season? Now, uh, there's two ways to look at this because um, this is technically a trade and draft or trade and free agency video. So are we talking uh, in the context of how these teams went in trade period or are we talking just generally improve? If it's broadly who will improve, you'd think Hawthorne, Adelaide and Fremantle are three bottom eight teams there who uh, I think logically have the potential to move up the ladder quickly next year. Uh, but if you're basing it on the trade period, I'd probably say Essendon uh, because of the ins and the consolidation and improvement of their best 22 whilst also holding picks in the first round in both this year and next and in the second round. I think I think they've done pretty well. And, uh, we, you know, it was only 2021 that they made finals anyway. So there's a baseline there. There's some talent. They've got some experience. They've plugged some gaps. I think that's a fairly solid argument for Essendon. Um, Sydney as well. Uh, they have a strong case to improve. Obviously made the grand final demolished by injury last year, still made it to a semi-final, no, sorry, a uh, elimination final, and then improved their best 22 by getting a first-choice Ruckman. Um, Hamlin comes in as, as some key back depth. They get Taylor Adams into their list. They're one who could potentially shoot back into the top four. So that's my answer to that question. John Meeks asks, uh, what are some big trades we could possibly see next year? Now, what I've done here, without really any indication of, um, of rumor or anything like that, well, in some cases, yes, but what I've done is gone to see which big players are out of contract next year. So Logan McDonald's one of them that's been talked about as a potential target for Fremantle. I'm sure West Coast will knock on the door as well, probably Collingwood or something like that. Um, Sean Darcy from Fremantle that is getting a bit of buzz in Perth. He is a free agent at the end of the year and there's this talk of Geelong being um, heavily interested. Jamara Ugal Hagen, I could see looking at the Western Bulldogs forward line mix, you know, with Sam Darcy, Aaron Norton, um, and Jordan Croft joining as well. Maybe he looks... Um, well, I think he'll be seen as gettable by Hawthorne and, and you know, potentially Collingwood as well. Um, and I think he will be a name of much discussion next year. Taron Thomas comes out of contract. There's been multiple reports of a potential trade for him over the last couple of years. Brandon Stasevic, I reckon, I've heard a little bit of a suggestion that the Eagles have, have been into him for a while. Could we convince him to leave the Brisbane Lions and play for West Coast is a different question, but I, that's one name I, I like the look of. And then, of course, Tim English is also a free agent. Uh, West Coast and Fremantle possibly interested. Fremantle doubly so if they lose Sean Darcy. So you could see a, a combo of English and Jackson being pretty dynamic, but we'll see what happens there. So there's just some names that could switch clubs next year. And some quicker questions to end it. Oh, sorry, there is another West Coast question. Shannon Humphreys asks, are West Coast getting into listed free agents in the listed free agency period? Now, they can because they have an enlist spot. They could take one um, and just take the four draft picks. That's probably going to make sense. But who? I don't know. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the list of free agency space. But there is, you know, in terms of WA names, there's Jeremy Sharp, uh, who is without a contract as it currently stands. Trey Rusco got the list by Collingwood. Razio Fantasia also didn't find a new club and as it currently stands, does not have a contract with Port. That would be a weird one for West Coast, but I could see us randomly sniffing around for a Razio Fantasia. And one player that I think of some value that should get picked up by someone is Toby McLean. Probably doesn't fit our profile at all, um, but I kind of like the look of him back in the day. He, I've lost touch with how good he is now, and he obviously got delisted, but I think there's talent there. But to answer your question, I, I would expect us to not actually draft any of these players. Ado Bado asks, do you reckon Collingwood need Schultz? Um, they don't need him, but I think it has improved their best 22. Uh, I don't think they necessarily needed him. But 33 goals, small forward last year. Um, top five in the league for tackles inside 50. Underrated player. He will improve that team. Did they need him? No, they just won the premiership. And um, yeah, but I think he's an upgrade on Ginnivan. He he asks, will North Melbourne get Curtin? Maybe. Now, I've read online that North Melbourne really like Curtin and there is a chance they pick him at three. But I've also heard conflicting reports that they go Dersmer at three. Brady Rawlings himself has alluded to the possibility that they... Well, he's alluded to the fact that North haven't drafted tour early in drafts, and that kind of foreshadowed a potential Daniel Curtin pick this year. I think they really like his character, even if um, they don't necessarily think he's maybe the third best talent in the draft. But the thing with Curtin, as, as good as he is, he's not a traditional key back. He is kind of an oversized flanker. And while I think he is worthy of a top five pick, probably broadly speaking, like he's a good player... I don't think he really ticks the box for North Melbourne. So I'm iffy, but I think it genuinely has potential. Uh, Ubra asked, do you think that Corns should just call into his own show and say some outlandish shit like a supporter at this point? Because his bias on anything Port at this stage is just amateurish. 
I agree. I agree. I, I don't take Cancorns particularly seriously. I don't dislike him. Like, I don't just don't have it in my heart to hate anyone or anything like that. But it just makes me cringe. I think he says a lot of dumb stuff. He says some good stuff, but he, he just, like, packages a lot of it up in weird aggression. And equally, you know, if he was ever praising West Coast, I'd equally be like, yeah, whatever. And finally, uh, Ben Chaplin asks, what the fuck are Frio and Essendon doing? Um, I think Essendon, I like their moves. Considering they didn't really give up much in terms of draft collateral, they haven't really sacrificed a long-term position. They have improved their best 22. It was probably a bit of a stale team, perhaps, um, and a new coach, new perspective, plug some list gaps. I like that move. Fremantle, it's a little bit murky what their exact strategy is. Uh, do they really rate next year's draft? Are they loading up for Logan McDonald? Uh, who knows? But what I will say is I was surprised they didn't make more efforts to improve their best 22. Let two best 22 players go, plus Joel Hamling. No one's coming in. So um, that one surprised me a little bit, but uh, time will tell on Fremantle. Anyway, guys, that is the end of that video. Um, let me know if you enjoyed this and if you want to do one of these more you know, in the future as well. Um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I have no idea. But if you, if you have some questions, chuck them in the comments and if there's enough, I'll do a part two. So, um, really appreciate all the support lately guys. And I am going to go edit these videos. This is my entire life now, but thank you very much. I enjoy this process with you and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.